I would like to first of all um, invite uh, Jan uh, for the series here. Um, Jan is a process engineer at heart. Um, she has extremely deep roots in uh, you know technology, designing, developing, testing, implementing you know various types of solutions over the years. Um, using her you know knowledge and uh, experience uh, as uh, guiding vehicles for um, supporting clients. Um, um, serving them in many capacities. She tailors and transforms enterprises for best outcomes um, with uh, many people like counterparties, partners, auditors, and certainly regulators, um, you know, navigating um, troublesome choppy waters of, you know, financial services. Um, she also brings a lot of uh, credentials uh, you know, with uh, standards like um, Federal Financial Institution Examination Council, um, International Standards Organization, National Institute of Standards and Technology, Control Objectives for you know, um, IT, uh, Financial Industry Regulator uh, Authority, um, so, so Securities um, you know, Industry um, Essential Certificate, you know, series number 99. Uh, many other things she has, but I do want to highlight one important thing. She has a Master's of Achievement in Business Resilience. And many people think like, okay, yet another master's, you know, so certificate or things like that, but it is not that. There are only uh, fewer than 200 practitioners in North America with that level of accreditation. Um, that includes, uh, you know, many other things like, uh, you know, certified business resilience auditor, relationship manager, and a resilience IT professional. So all these backgrounds. So she's uh, definitely the, the go-to person here. And, um, Ray um, is a, a managing director with uh, Promontory. Um, it's a business uh, consulting division within IBM uh, Consulting, where he co-heads, uh, you know, digital assets uh, practice, working with clients on many large-scale program design, uh, management, or the intersection of uh, regulation, risk, and technology. His current areas of focus primarily include uh, cryptocurrency regulations and risk. Uh, cloud adoption, risk data governance, operational and IT uh, management, along with large scale um, risk and compliance planning and executions. Um, so he has a lot of things uh, to his uh, you know, credentials um, uh, with uh, many financial um, banks that he has supported, um, many other things that he has done at this point. He has broad background in consulting and IT for financial institution has uh, led, you know, different companies like Tata Consultancy Service, Dell, Virt, USA, and American Management System. So um, welcome, Ray. Welcome, Jan. Uh, I hope Ray is able to, you know, talk. Um, if or not, we will, um, you know, use Jan uh, to support us as we can, okay? Um, so, Jan, you know, a, a long time back, I remember how exciting it was to, you know, put my, um, you know, card into the ATM machine and get money out. You know, there was like, oh, my God, moment uh, at that point, you know, that this is the excellent what technology can do. Um, but now, you know, plastic has become very common and we are able to use mobile apps uh, and several digital tools to send money to our family and loved ones and, uh, do transactions, uh, pay the bills, and even trade, um, you know, investments and securities and stuff like that. Um, and uh, this is all the more reason why I would like to truly understand what fintech is. You know, this is, a, you know, a new word coined at this point or been available for quite some time. Um, so is it the application of finance in technology or is it the application of technology in finance? Could you just help us understand what exactly is fintech and what it is not? Right, right, right. I, I, hey, first of all, thanks for having me today. Uh, so fintech, right, it's kind of a cool new buzzword. But if you think about it, they all kind of grew up together. It's almost like a yin yang um, that they sort of morphed into. I mean, there was always financial functions, you know, brokerage trading goes back to, you know, the 1800s under the button tree right here in New York. But the technology came useful for back office, right? So people mm -hmm. were using it in that respect, thinking of it just crunching the numbers, back office functions, you know, the statements, the accounting side of things. But if you think about it, the more they got to know each other, right? 
the floor, the back office, the, and then the middle office, the front office, it kind of morphed like a, eh, like a fungus, right? Uh -huh. Where Fin tech became a yin yang where they really had to get to know each other, right? They were like, now they're inseparable. You can't do one without the other. They can't say, oh, you back office people see you around. We're going down to the floor with our buy and sell tickets and we're doing what we do. We don't need you. The need has become just inseparable. Okay. And they're really, really um, close together. I mean, if you think about it, we really are in a space now where we can't split fin and tech anymore and it's what five ten years Financial tools plus tech or financial functions plus tech tools has become fintech right so now they're married and you hear about things like blockchain and, and follow the money and uh, over those breadcrumbs and, and the dark web and all that kind of crypto stuff that we all want to be careful of right mm -hmm. but i think that's how fintech came uh, I think that's their romance right there. Fantastic. You know, I love the, the romance, the marriage, the yin and yang, you know. Um, so, Ray, just to, you know, catch, uh, catch you up to speed, um, I, we did give you, a, you know, an introduction about, uh, you know, you and Jan. And I started with Jan asking, like, you know, explain me what fintech is, you know. Um, so that's what she was talking about. You know, it's more of a yin and yang, you know, one, one supports uh, each other and there is a, a romance over there. Uh, and marriage over there. So, you know, I just wanted to expand on what uh, Jan was talking about. Um, in, in, you know, in, in the world of fintech, there is a, you know, ABCD, as people sometimes call, you know, the, there is artificial intelligence, there is blockchain and cloud computing and, you know, data, um, you know, big data, however we want to call it. Um, so I just wanted to expand on this and say, um, from your perspective, what are some of the applications that are currently in use uh, within the fintech uh, space, as well as what are you expecting that will come in the horizon, like maybe in the next few years? Um, so can you just elaborate with some examples, Ray? Sure. I, well, I think so. I'll, I'll try to stick to the ABCD uh, flow here. <laughs> um, but I think if you look at artificial intelligence, the dominant things that are being used today would be um, relatively mature artificial intelligence of the form of say machine learning models and things of that nature. Um, so things that help you predict um, either creditworthiness or proclivity to buy or um, other kinds of things like that. And obviously if you're, you know, if you've been on the planet for the last six months, you've heard a lot about things like chat GTP and large language models and those kinds of things. And you know, we certainly expect that those will play a key role, for example, in automating things like customer service conversations and various things of that nature, you know, and, and obviously there's some of that already in play in the form of various chatbots. I mean, an awful lot of times, and it's more true even with fintechs than with traditional institutions. If you go to a, a helpline or something, you're talking to a bot, you're not talking to a a live person in many cases, or maybe you talk to a bot for a while and if the bot can't help you, then you talk to a live person. But, um, you, you know, I think that the caution with the large language models is also, if you're reading the press, there's lots of examples of cases where um, they get into um, areas that you don't want them to get into. And especially in regulated financial products, you have to be very sure that you've constrained the bot or whatever form, whether it's a voice or a bot, you have to be sure that you've constrained it in such a way that you know what it's going to say and you know um whereas you know so you don't really want creativity you want a model that understands very well but then sticks to a script rather than a model that improvises um so i think that's a, a point of you know point to be thoughtful about there on well, so moving on to blockchain of course we have lots of blockchain apps and in the last year i've spent more time with cryptocurrency um, work than anything else. Um, so I think we have both, um, you know, we have both the blockchain as an um, underlying form for cryptocurrency, and then we have other emerging uses of blockchain, um, you know, some many within FinTech, but some even outside of FinTech, where the concept is blockchain is an immutable source of truth for a multiple set of people, whether it's a public blockchain or a permission blockchain, who need to see something and and also combined with a cryptographic proof that the thing they're looking at can't have been tampered with in a, a way that's um, 
harmful um, or a way that's not auditable, let's say. And um, so there's a lot of that. And I suspect many of the folks in the audience are involved with digital assets or cryptocurrencies or NFTs or things of that nature. So of course, you're, you're very familiar with it, mm -hmm. um, probably. Uh, third one you mentioned, I think was cloud. Yes, cloud computing. And cloud, um, well, cloud certainly not in any sense restricted to, um, to the fintech world, of course. But I, I think the, the, the big thing that cloud has given to the, to the whole world of startups and so forth is the ability to get started and get on the air with things without um, sort of the lead times associated with setting up a data center, purchasing your own IT infrastructure, you know, bringing in a staff that is involved with racking and stacking hardware and those kind of things. So a huge advantage in terms of time to market, um, huge advantage in terms of if you're say really lucky and your product really takes off and you need to grow quickly, huge advantage to being able to support that growth essentially just by writing checks as opposed to by ordering gear and setting it up and those kind of things. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, so I think that's the sort of obvious particular applicability there is you, you don't have to be in the IT infrastructure business to be in the, in the FinTech business or in any other business you want to be in. Um, and then what was the last one? Big data. Well, I think most of the things we've talked about, maybe not blockchain, but most of the other things we've talked about all depend on big data. Um, I mean, it was critical for, uh, it's been critical for AI, but it's even more critical for large language models where basically the current thinking is relatively few companies will be able to actually ever build large language models. And most of us will have to use either, um, you know, Google's model or um, the chat GPP model or one of the other models like that because it's total, combination of compute power and data you need in order to actually have one of these things is just beyond um, you know, most firms capability. So I think big data is critical for everything. Excellent, excellent. Wow, you know, that's a, that's a lot of information that you packed as well as, you know, sometimes we may have to have a, a separate et other webinar to unpack it as well. Maybe um, I can get into that one on time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, time is the most important currency, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah, but that's true. So you know, if some you know, I, I, as I'm hearing you speak, you know, uh, you know, limiting creativity, uh, the language models, um, and being able to actually, you know, these technologies actually helping us do, you know, uh, like call versus put or buy versus, you know, sell, um, you know, credit worthiness, and many other things that you are talking about. Um, it, 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 it makes me wonder like, okay, we are all working for our, you know, most important, uh, you know, resource, which is money, you know, we are mm -hmm. trading our time for money all the time. And, you know, we are trying to make sure that we are saving for our loved ones and college savings, retirement savings, and many other things. Now, when we think about uh, financial, you know, spaces in normally, you know, you think about in terms of uh, risks relating to market risk, credit risk, liquidity risk, you know, operational risk and, you know, things of that nature. And then when you actually start thinking in terms of short term versus long term, or is it like a domestic investment or a foreign investment? Um, you know, you can add some different colors to all these types of risks and come up with some additional types of risk, like domestic, you know, risk uh, for liquidity and, you know, stuff like that. Um, now, technology has its own risks, you know, security, privacy, and, you know, you name it, you know, multiple other risks. Now, so when you put these two things together, you know, financial uh, element of it, technology elements of it, and then create a new space called FinTech, where new types of products are emerging in leveraging both of them, what kind of risks, in your opinion, do you see emerging? Like, you know, we need to pay attention to these kinds of risks, not necessarily this and that, but something that is unique, that is combination of both. What are some of those fintech specific risks that you are seeing that companies should really pay attention to as well as individuals that we should really pay attention to. Any thoughts, Ray, because you have a big risk background? Sure. Um, well, I'll start by saying, I, I think in some sense, the risks, like the categories of risk, operational risk, of which technology is a well understood segment within, you know, if you look at a large bank or financial institutions risk structure, you know, they have that risk, of course. Um, and credit risk, market risk, all those things apply. I'd say in the FinTech world, the first thing that I advise clients to be very clear about is whether 
they are strictly a technology provider or whether what they are going to do as a firm involves actually handling people's money in some sense. Mm. So you can look at fintechs that provide technology and then maybe banks use it to offer an innovative loan project or product or an innovative something. But many fintechs actually are offering a financial service, meaning they're taking, they're taking money and they're holding it or they're lending money, or they're making payments with money, or they're buying securities with money, or they're holding securities, all those kinds of things. You know, every one of those things has license requirements. Every one of those things has regulatory requirements. And so probably the most important risk, the most important thing I think for a fintech company to do at the start is get really clear, are we actually a financial institution or are we a tech company? And then secondly, if we're a financial institution, what are the licensing rules and the risks that we have to manage as a financial institution in order to deliver our service? Then if, if you, if, as we get down into the issue though of say use cases in the technology space that you have to think about um, that are, are actually technology related, I think certainly the biggest one that plagues say the crypto space, which is where I've been spending a lot of my time in various ways is information security. I mean, you know, the crypto space compared to the rest of the financial markets isn't that big, but I think the losses last year were around $3 billion in various forms of cyber breaches. And, um, you know, a lot of this is because classically the industry has been committed to open source code. A lot of good things about open source code. Open source code can be very secure once it's mature, but in the meantime, if everybody can look at your code, a lot of people can figure out how to attack your code. Yes. Um, so I think you know, if I was going to say one thing to every fintech, I'd say, for goodness sake, you know, really, really, really worry about, you know, information security, crypto proofs if you're in the digital space. But if you're not in the digital space, you know, pay attention to encryption, you know, spend money on code audits, do the kind of things you need to protect yourself and either protect your clients or even if you're a technology provider, protect the bank or the securities firm or whatever kind of traditional provider is going to be offering your, you know, your product. I mean, that, that to me is the top one. I think the other one really is, you know, understand the compliance requirements of the offering, regardless of whether it's your offering or somebody else's and make sure you understand how to sort of design for that code for that provide for that. Excellent, excellent. I really like your, you know, zoning in, um, in terms of, you know, making sure that are you a financial company or a technology company? You know, that's, that's a big, you know, yes or no, uh, exactly. uh, you know, thing. And then from there, you know, looking into the information security. Now, as I, as you were relating, I was talking, thinking in my head about those, um, you know, the four V's of big data that people call, like, you know, the volume, velocity, variety, and, uh, you know, um, veracity, the, you know, four things, and they are exponentially growing these days, right? You know, exponentially growing. So, you know, making sure that the data that we are collecting uh, is procured, uh, you know, in the right way or secured in the right way and compliant with, you know, many governance uh, regulations, regional, global, you know, regulations is something that you need to keep in mind. And I really like how you zoned in on this. Um, now, um, Jan, I, I want to ask you this question because as I was hearing Ray speak about governance and compliance and information security and, you know, stuff like that, um, I had to go back to this financial crisis that we, you know, uh, and I'm sure people are maybe thinking about, you know, what happened in the last few weeks about the Silicon Valley Bank and stuff like that. But we had, you know, um, a financial scandal with Enron. Um, and then we came back with, uh, oh, we have to have some internal and disclosure controls and, you know, many other role responsibility and stuff like that. And we came up with Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, I don't know if that taught us any great lessons, um, but then we came back in 2008 with, uh, you know, another fiasco um, that led us to the, the Dodd-Frank Act. Um, and now, you know, fast forward, you know, another 15 years or, you know, so we are in 2023 and we are talking about this um, Silicon Valley Bank or, and, the, you know, Signature Bank, which were not able to, you know, manage risk, if I were to put it this way, you know, you know, in a relative simple terms. 
Um, so what seems to be the issue? We seem to have regulations and laws that you know either catch up to do certain things, but you know are the processes failing or are people failing? Uh, from your GRC perspective, um, you know if you could you know lay the the land here to be good. Sure. I mean, I, I think what happens is people become very guilty of optimism, right? Everybody thinks it's not going to happen to me. It's no big deal, right? Do I really have to do this? Because there's no enforcement. When you're coming from a GRC perspective, right? You're advising, you, you know, you have diligence and passion for it, but that doesn't mean senior leadership will and that they'll sign off on it. I mean, a lot of times the big four will come in and do the same thing, right? Your KPMGs and your EY and say, we're advising you, we're advising you, right? And a lot of times that gets shelved. To your point, spending money on insurance like that isn't always the, the bright and shiny, right? It's not the, the item that, that distracts one. Oh, we can do this cool thing. Well, why would I want to do, you know, something that would ensure me from resilience, uh, you know? So I think that um, what, what people need to put forward, right, is this continuous cycle of improvement. Keep in mind to be consistent on your rules. Keep in mind, you know, um, right, you have this desire to invest time and money to, for your reputation to be the best, but you also have to minimize the risk operationally. I mean, when you look at all the stripes of risk, operational, right, uh, reputational, really important people. I mean, look at the debacle we just had, um, as well as the fact that regulators can just go, I think I'm going to find so-and-so this much today because there's really not a band, all right, on, on the numbers that they can find you. But uh, let me just say, because <laughs> uh, let me just finish this with the, um, uh, the idea that I would advise any firm to do their stress testing end to end from a system standpoint. So your technical functions are tight when you go to your secondary system. I would also advise a firm, right, to be tight on the way you think about your risks. Don't just do self-assessments, do some scenario analysis, be a little creative. What if, what if what happened to SVB happened to us? Are we good? Huh, let's think about that. It is worth the time that you invest. You know, it's worth the time. In my, it's worth the time for people to put on a helmet and knee pads before they decide that they're going to go, um, you know, skateboarding, right? So it's kind of uh, same, but different, right? And just the final thing I wanted to say about that domino effect don't forget, banks the size of SVB, FRB, and Signature, really, didn't have to do that same kind of stress testing. They were below that, that new number, right? But they, they also were guilty of optimism that because we're under that number, we don't have to. So if you think about that and the fact that people don't like to think about negative things, and risk is a four-letter word that's kind of negative to most people. Right. So if they can table that and push it off to the side, that that I think it is a tendency um, that humans have not really a failing, just a tendency. So I think I answered your question. I hope I answered. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's very interesting because when um, you were mentioning this, um, um, I, I have a book called Organized Common Sense. Um, and um, not so common anymore, Shivam. <laughs> yes. But yeah. Maybe I should write my next book called Common Sense for Sale. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, the, in that book, I basically say, you know, risk is not a bad word. Uh, you know, it, 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 you know, stands an opportunity. It's, you know, so uh, there is an opportunity that is as well as a threat. You know, if you don't do certain things, it's going to, you know, come and hurt you. If you do certain things, it's probably going to help you out. So, you know, risk is never, uh, you know, that's why we say negative risk, positive risk, opportunity, threats, and, you know, all those things. Yes, I'm, I'm here preaching to the choir here. Um, but, you know, if you don't manage risk in the same book, I say, if you do not manage risk, don't worry, risk will manage you. <laughs> but the later option is not going to be pretty. Um, so, you know, when you were talking about the end-to-end -end testing, I was thinking about in terms of the Agile uh, Manifesto, where we are talking about like, you know, individuals and interactions or processes and tools. So yes, these risk-based ideas, making sure that this is happening, making sure that this particular stress testing is happening. You talked about what if scenarios, and that is nothing but a risk. You know, it's not a product owner that needs to come and say, what is the risk of doing this? Or what is the risk of not doing this? And, you know, risk is owned by everybody. And that's the fundamentally the reason why the product backlog is actually called risk-adjusted prioritized product backlog. But we remove all these adjectives 
this congested and we directly go to product backlog and we forget the fact that you know how we even prioritize without thinking about risks in the first place to begin with um so you know when when you are mentioning these things you are thinking like okay application lifecycle management tools are really important in you know in, in these kind of things whether you are managing a process or a product you now see in some companies the process is the product right sometimes you know when you are implementing six sigma for instance or um, the process is your product when you are applying grc related things like you know grc transfer governance risk management and compliance for those of you that uh, are hearing one more acronym here um, but you know those are some things to keep in mind now i do want to you know go back to you again jan uh, and ask you one more question because with your, your experience, I'm sure you have, uh, you know, encountered many GRC related, you know, got shoes, uh, you know, things that did not go well, things that should have happened that did not, you know, get picked up and things they are doing that should not be done because that's against compliance, against compliance and stuff like that. I'm sure you have seen that from a regional as well as from a global perspective. And I'm sure there are a lot of regulations, you know, with your so many credentials that you you were talking about, you know, with so many of those, I'm sure you have exposure to many types of uh, global and standard uh, regulations and, um, uh, you know, things that we could be using. So based upon all those experience, if you were to zoom in on one or two standards and say, we really should apply these standards and how you sh we should go about applying those standards, you know, some starting points for our audience to think about, what would that standard be? Um, can you, you know, elaborate on that? Um, just with a broad brush, if you can keep compliant with the U.S. standards, you're sure. good to go everywhere else in the world. Okay. Uh, I, I would suspect that we have more rules and more reasons to do things. Um, uh, the joke is basically we have more uh, creative criminals in the United States than other places in the world. <laughs> but, wow. Okay. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Okay, I hope so. That's, that's the best guideline, right? I mean, you can certainly keep a watch on OFAC and, and, and FinCEN, right, to make sure that you're covered there. Your SOC audit, your SOC 2 audits, your pen testing from a vulnerability standpoint on the IT side of the world. Again, I want to mention Reg SCI that comes from the securities world, but, you know, it, it's that security, confidentiality, and integrity of all your data while it's, um, you know, encrypted in transit, encrypted at rest, so you can kind of keep safe in that regard. And then, you know, so you're really kind of juggling a lot of balls. And then operationally, you want your skill sets of your people to be able to back each other up. That's also very important to your resilience and your risk. If you have a key man risk, like Shriram, if you're the only guy that can handle this and you're out of the country, what do we do? Oh, does Ray have any idea? Well, let's ask Ray. Oh, I have a kind of an idea what he did. So those are the kinds of things that you have to layer in on your risk and your resilience. So from a standards perspective, I think it's standards and then just a little bit more to put the cherry on top. Put the cherry on top. You know, that's that's interesting uh, because um, the good thing about standard, I always say, you know, in my training and teaching classes, you know, the good thing about standard is that there is one. And the bad thing about standard is that there are many. So which one to pick? which one to apply, to what extent, what you pick and what you apply. Um, so, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, we need to actually start thinking in terms of the risk that poses uh, for our products and our projects and businesses and, you know, things like our customers. And so thinking from that aspect, what our specific ISO standards or IT standards, right. um, you know, that we need to apply. Um, I mean, I guess if you stick with FIFIC, because it is global with the Examination Council, you're in very good shape. I think that okay. would be like your your multivitamin. Oh, multi. Okay, I, I like that multivitamin for that. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm taking some notes as I speak as well. So you know, part of my continuous improvement, uh, continuous cycle of improvement. So uh, thank you, you know, Jan, for um, summarizing that from my end to end life cycle perspective. So you know, um, just to you know wrap things up over here. Um, Ray, from your experience of risk management, compliance management, and you know many other areas within this uh, cryptocurrency as well that you mentioned, um, what best practices do you think um, the fintech companies particularly should start focusing on 
um, that's coming in the emerging markets right now. So it's soon to come. So get ready kind of, uh, you know, standards that people should really be thinking about. Um, do you have any gut feel of what they may be or what ideas? Well, um, well, first of all, you know, Jan, Jan gave a good list of, say, typical standards that apply today. And I agree that for most fintech companies, the FFIEC material, which is the Federal Financial Institutions Exam Council, would be like a great start. It's the most extensive. Uh, it's the most extensive material. So, for example, you know, there's a whole book on information security in effect and a whole book on IT operations uh, infrastructure and um, information. Um, and uh, so when we work, for example, with state examiners, you know, New York examiners, those kinds of groups, they often still are relying on that material as sort of their Bible as well. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but it doesn't apply directly to the securities industry. So SCI is important. If you're in certain spaces, there's a, um, an SEC um, uh, rule coming related to qualified custodians. This is a big deal in the digital asset and cryptocurrency space, uh, but it's not necessarily a big deal in a lot of other fintech spaces. So, but but I, I, I probably the biggest advice I would give technical people, and I've given this both to fintech companies and to traditional institutions, is that um, in the world of DevOps, which most you know young creative um, technologists grew up in. There is an emphasis generally on, you know, combining in the team, you know, technology with business expertise so that basically you have a really tight team that understands, you know, the technologists understand exactly what the business, um, you know, leader is trying to do at whatever, you know, whatever she's after from a, you know, financial point of view. And, and so there's a good, a good uh, you know, synergy there. But what I see people miss over and over is the need to have um, the right compliance and risk experts actually also integrated in the team. I mean, you know, I have a master's in computer science, but when I got it or when I was a programmer before I got it, I certainly didn't understand risk and compliance in a deep way. And, you know, you know, you can come out of the best program, technical program in the world and you won't know much about that. Um, and, you know, if you look at the larger financial institutions, they all have lots and lots of compliance specialists. And there's two things I say. One is you have to have compliance people on the team if you're doing a compliance sensitive application. You know, there's no way you should trust yourself to be sure that you're right about, you know, fully complying with sanctions laws, AML things. I mean, the penalties are huge. They include criminal penalties. You don't really want to go to jail, um, you know, probably. And, um, you know, so that would be one thing. And then the thing I say to compliance people is you have to stretch too. You have to understand the operations of this product that you're advising on. It's one thing to know the rules, like exactly what the rule book says, but you have to really interpret those rules in the context of the operation in order to really help, um, you know, if the, if the if the procedure, if the thing you're doing is all going to be embodied in code to make sure that the code's right, and if it's code plus people, which is the more common case, you have to focus on both. What's the code doing? What are the people doing? And how do you make sure that it really actually meets the letter and the spirit of the laws and the rules? Very good, very good, excellent, excellent. Thank you, thank you, um, Ray. That that's, uh, I mean, I I took you know so much notes over here. I don't know if you can see that or not. Um, you know, one thing both of you are trying to, you know, connect with, you know, that's very interesting that both of you are, you know, you know, zoning in on that, um, the, the, the multidisciplinary skills, like, you know, the skill set needs to be uh, actually you know, multidisciplinary. So when we say cross-functional, it's not like I have a developer um, and a, a, a tester together. It's like a developer thinking like a tester, a tester thinking like a developer. And, you know, and then you added additional things into, and then we talk about T-shaped skills, you know, I mean, in management terms, we say T-shaped. And I also tell, you know, that has actually left the thing. We are looking for pie-shaped and E-shaped and, you know, that, that you know, those things are all uh, already... <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's all collaboration, right? You have to think like a team. You really, really do. Exactly, exactly. Absolutely. You know, that's the reason why, you know, when um, Ray was talking more about, um, I want the risk people to be inside and the risk people also should stretch to think in terms of, you know, other operational considerations. 
it's it's really bringing the team thinking like together everyone achieves more you know it's like collaboration it's not like my way your way it's our way so we you know risk is everybody's responsibility if you see it say you know those kinds of things are repeatedly coming up and uh, you know it's good to see those considerations uh in terms of uh not just the finance aspects of it not just the technical aspects of it, but both of it. And so we need to maybe even see beyond that to see what are the customers, the markets, and you know other things that we have to see. So that, that these are all coming uh, very nicely together. In fact, I remember um, in the last year, there was a new term that is being introduced, BIS, uh, or new terms, uh, BIS technologists. We want people to be BIS technologists and BIS linguists, um, and not just uh, you know, multifunctional, you know, we need to be able to think across the spectrum and stuff like that. So Jen, um, I do have, you know, some audience questions that have come up. So, uh, you know, in the interest of time, I would like to ask uh, this question to you. Um, the, the question here is, you know, can you please share some futuristic standards or regulations that are coming in the horizon, especially in light of the banks collapsing, you know, other security vulnerabilities and global financial system? So I know on the horizon, right, they're talking about the new DJ asset fed now for July-ish, right? I would suspect there may be a nice bundle of regulations to go along with that. I'm sure Ray has heard the same. Um, in regards to the banks, I mean, they should do their stress testing and keep their, you know, their capital margins in better, in healthier shape for like those smaller banks. Um I don't know. In, in so many ways, I wish the, um, I know that this is just kind of off the cuff, but I think if the folks um, in, in the Federal Reserve were at, uh, it had a little more teeth in what they were doing, maybe if they had people that had field experience from the corporate world and paid like the corporate world, we could all be in there instead of advising, you know, individual firms, maybe they could have a different angle and maybe we can rate Rate banks like uh, New York um, has an ABC rating on their yes. restaurants. I don't know that it's all over, but um, maybe we have ABC ratings for banks. Just a thought. Perhaps outsourcing idea of how to rate. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Hopes on the horizon. Hopes um, on the horizon. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, uh, somewhat related question to you, Jan. Um, there's a I, I think you were talking about this so I just wanted to ask throw the same question to you as well so one of the questions that uh, a person is asking here is uh, do you recommend any specific journals or articles uh, or I'm sure they are referring to magazines to for people to keep up with in terms of these regulations uh, checking FinCEN makes a lot of sense um you know, as coming from the broker dealer world, so like the FIA smart brief, the SIFMA smart brief, anything from ISACA, um, all of that I get on a daily basis. Exactly. Um, I'm probably leaving one or two out, but um, yeah, just an idea. even yeah. Yahoo Finance can have nuggets of wisdom. I right. hope that helps. Right. Good. And, and yeah, I, I think, you know, the ISO also released a, a new standard for risk management called 31,000 ISO, 31,000 for risk management principles. Uh, not not prescriptive guidance, but, you know, generic guidance in terms of how that could be applied. That's also something to keep in mind. Oh, yes. Yes. Of course, the ISO, we probably didn't mention ISO, NIST, COVID, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Control objectives and stuff like that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, but you did mention ISACA, so COVID and all those things get rolled under that, you know, the ITIL and, you know, many other things get rolled under that as well. Um, so one other question, I think this probably may be our wrapping question in the interest of time. Um, I'm going to ask this to Ray. Ray, um, from the different uh, standards that you are aware of, specifically to risk, um, can you think of any program slash IT operational cyber standards our audience should uh, evaluate for their fintech companies? Um, well, we may have in the broadest sense, hit them. Hit them yeah. um, in other words, I think that, um, you know, with FinTech, the trick is to figure out, you know, given your products, what laws, what regulations, what licensing regimes apply to you. Um, and, you know, these days, first of all, every regulator has a website where you can pretty much easily pull down statutes, regulations, guidance material, you know, it, you know, the depth varies, but generally speaking, once you figure out 
who's regulating you, you can figure out what they're looking at. Um, and um, and then I guess the other thing I'd say is, you know, you really want to read you, you really want to read the the news like typically the tech news. And so it, say in the digital asset space, there's the CoinDesk Daily newsletter, but there's all kinds of things like that. Um, and you know the problems come out and they get publicized and you know so you ought to be really quick about saying well if these guys just had a 50 million dollar breach you know what's the first take at least on what went wrong and what are we doing to fix it and then the broader things like NIST you know the national information um, uh, for standards and technology that that Jan mentioned is you know I think one of the best places to look for general technical, no specific regulator, but general technical guidance on information security, cloud, you know, IT risk, all that kind of kind of thing. Um, sure, all right, excellent, excellent. And we we talk a lot of things like FinFin, SOC2, vulnerability testing, you know, Rex, uh, CI, CIA, I'm sure non-repudiation, and, you know, many other things we already talked about. So um, I hope that gives uh, people um, the full, full, full context. Um, one one clarification I would like you from uh, uh, from from you specifically, Ray. You know, I know you mentioned AML, and I know what AML stands for. Uh, but you know, in the in the whole space of people talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence, you know, can you you know please you know help us understand what AML is? Well, it stands for any money laundering. So it generally involves some criminal activity, typically where you're trying to hide the source of the funds in various ways so that um, basically you can spend the money on legitimate things like buying a car and so forth. You know, So if you go back to things like the Sopranos, they were always laundering money so that they could live a respectable looking life, you know? Um, and then, you know, so whether it's drugs or uh, human trafficking or whatever, um, and then I think that, you know, there is a lot of evolution. I mean, this is a big area for AI um, and an area where uh, there's a lot of ways you can look at things. In the digital assets world, of course, the, the fact that blockchain actually has a public record of transactions, although not with the person, the person identified, um, means that there's traceability in, in some ways, new kinds of traceability available in that space that people can use. And, and again, there's a whole set of an ecosystem that's grown up of firms that provide analytics on the blockchain. So those are the kind of things that I think are, are um, new in that space. You know, money laundering, of course, has been around forever. I'd say these days, it's almost even more important to understand sanctions and OFAC and the kinds of things that basically are trade restrictions. Um, but yep. 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 critically important. Fantastic. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, you know, that AML is not somehow misunderstood as, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning. It's more no, 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 it's not, it's, yeah. so, you no, know, it's it, any money laundering. Yes, any money laundering. Um, uh, okay, good, uh, good. Thank you very much, Ray. And thank you, Jan. You know, so I, I do want to, you know, wrap it up. I think I've answered uh, pretty much uh, all the questions that have come up here as well. Uh, but in the interest of time, I do want to thank both of you. Um, Jan and uh, you know Ray for your um, your availability and your support here to share your wealth of knowledge uh, and wisdom here. I really appreciate that. And I know we had a little bit of a technical you know snafu here, but you know here we are. You know, so we were able to you know talk uh, pretty much everything through right from the beginning. Um, one thing I want to leave our audience with is you know we have we have barely scratched the surface of fintech in our webinar. Okay, so. We have just, you know, maybe opened the table of contents. We are not gone in, you know, looked into the lots of details. And suddenly we moved all the way to the appendix and started looking at different terminologies, different uh, regulations and stuff like that. So there is a, you know, huge uh, content that is inside that. And that is not something that we would be able to cover because I do have some time people coming and asking, we need to go deeper into this. You know, if we go deeper into any one particular thing, we are going to leave something else on the table for not being picked up. So the idea here is to, Spread the uh, knowledge about there is things coming up. And so we need to become aware of how technology is uh, accelerating in today's world and how that's going to be accelerating, you know, much more into the finance space as well. And, you know, be conscious about that um, and bring the, the notion of risk into everything that we do. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you again, Jan, one more time. 
uh, you and uh, Ray, you know, uh, um, appreciate your um, support here. With that, I will kind of leave it. And if there are any questions that uh, really comes up at this point, you know, I may not be able to pick it up. We will um, see what those questions are and, you know, get back with you. Thank you, Ray. Ray and thank you, Jan. Thank you for having me. Okay. Bye, Enjoy guys. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.